Basement, everyone. How we doing? Good, yes? Uh, can I just say you are a welcome relief from last night's crowd, which was a real stare. A walkout already? <laughs> you broke the seat. What a fucking way to start the show, may I just say. I've never been upstaged by just a man having a pint, but well done, my man. Also, may I say, what? who the fuck are you? You shouldn't be at a comedy show. You should be judging a rowing competition or some sort. Do you do whatever I want? Whatever you want. I don't know how you won that argument, but you did. <laughs> Already, what a welcome relief from last night. Where there was no chair breaking or fun, whatever the fuck that was. You, the, I, but what a wonderful wet cough that is. May I just say, reminding us all, COVID, COVID, yes, no. Everyone makes that joke when they cough and then no one laughs because we're still at risk. Now, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for coming. May I just say last night in this row were five people from the United States, from Florida. And I would say that our politics a bit, we disagreed. And, and we figured that out within about 30 seconds of looking at each other and their energy was bad. And at the end of the show, they walked up to me and then we just talked about baseball for 45 minutes because I'm very bad at sending boundaries with strangers. You know, what I, like I, all I want to do is not do my show. I just want to talk about, to that mustachioed fuck back there because I guarantee he has a room in his house with a wooden eagle and a lot of leather books that I could not read. You know what I mean? He'd offer you a drink and you think it's whiskey and then he goes, hmm, 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 poison. You know what I'm saying? Uh, well, welcome, everyone, to the basement. Uh, I'm so happy uh, that you've gathered here. A couple of quick production notes before we start. Uh, I'm going to be wearing a baseball cap uh, the whole time. Now, people assume I'm wearing this baseball cap because I'm losing my hair. And I am losing my hair. And not in the fun way. Like you, brother. Oh, no, that's just shaved. I thought you were a bald. i got to tell you. Are you losing your hair? You are. I'm, how do you feel about it? There we fucking go. <laughs> It's fucking weird, too, because at a certain... Like, how old are you? Uh, uh, 26. What was with all the thought and delays in that answer? <laughs> you don't know me yet. <laughs> are you that guy's son? <laughs> what the fuck? No more crowd interaction. I didn't realize I wasn't performing for people. I'm performing for coyotes you meet during a drug trip. How old are you? I don't know you yet. <laughs> Have you ever been to a regatta? I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> like I'm losing my hair, but in like not in that fucking way where it looks like I'm in charge of the Enterprise. I'm, lo I'm losing my hair. It just looks like I'm wearing Iron Man's helmet all the time. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, the reason why I keep a baseball cap on is because if I am not wearing a baseball cap, I look like a police officer that's been involved in a lot of questionable shootings. <laughs> It's a, it's a brutal look. It's one of those looks that people ask you questions to try and explain it. Like people will go, uh, how old are you? And then I'll say 38 and I can see them go, no, that doesn't change it. You know, I am, I am 38. I enjoy being uh, 38. It's the first age where I feel like I look 38. You know what I mean? Like I gave up, but it was a long time ago. You know what I mean? Like I am, I'm 38. I'm 38 with a 20 year old brother. My brother is, uh, is 20. Uh, I, uh, he's clearly the favorite in the family, clearly the favorite. For example, his name is Cullen, which is Gaelic for gift from God. And my name is John, which is Canadian for toilet. And everywhere else for guy who pays for prostitutes. And I, and I like being 38. I didn't always like my age. I didn't always like my generation. I am an elder millennial. I didn't always like being an elder millennial. I dig it now. I'm proud of the contributions we've made to society, what we brought to the table, literally. The charcuterie board, you're fucking welcome. <laughs> what were you all doing with your cutting boards before we showed up on the scene? Preparing vegetables like cunts? <laughs> and we showed up and said, let's get some expensive meats and cheeses on here that none of us can pronounce and we don't know what animals they're from. <laughs> we're starting this dinner party off right. <laughs> I love a charcuterie board, so easy to make. 
You just start making a sandwich and then stop immediately. <laughs> and we remove fear from the world. I see baby boomers and Gen X faces. You guys did nothing about all the fear in the world. We removed some of it. Time was, you saw a fellow with a neck tattoo. You got scared. You thought, oh my God, I'm about to see a dead body. Now you see a fellow with a neck tattoo. All you think is, holy fuck, this latte is going to be good. <laughs> Gen Z, my 20-year-old brothers and sisters, if you are in here, you are welcome. I have no problem with you. I quite enjoy looking down upon you. You don't know how fucking good you have it, living in gentrified neighborhoods. We lived in gentrifying neighborhoods. Do you know how weird it is to get mugged near a vegan restaurant? Generation Z, I love what you brought to the scene, you fucking weirdos, all dressed like tote bags. All having threesomes in the name of climate change? Who's that helping? They vape without ever having smoked cigarettes. What the fuck is going on? Vaping is a crutch you use to go from not smoking to not smoking. And these fucking 20 year olds just, oh, it's red. It matches my shoes. I love the casing. Do you understand to my old eyes, you look like you're using a wheelchair because you're lazy? Do you understand? And that's not coming from a place like, oh, I miss my 20s. I do not miss my 20s. Allow me to sum them up. I'm awkward, I'm leaving. There we go. <laughs> I, and I, I know you're, people in your 20s, you're staying up all night at this festival, you're doing fucking drugs, and they're doing ketamine. What the fuck? <laughs> do cocaine like adults, people. <laughs> What's the, ketamine? What the fuck is the, you know, cocaine? Let's keep going. Business, buy, sell, buy, sell. Ketamine. Mmm, hey, let's go to sleep, but be annoying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can feel some people over here going, John, I've never done drugs before. I don't understand that joke. I feel left out. If you've never done drugs and you've gotten to this point in this society, do not feel left out. My hat is fucking off. That you've gotten this far without trying drugs? I haven't been able to do that. That guy's not been able to do it. That guy, that fucker with the mustache back there definitely hasn't been able to do it. I wake up some mornings, you know what I mean? I look at the, what I have to do that day and I just think, mm-mm, we're spicing this shit up. I'm taking cocaine, I have a bar mitzvah to attend. I wanna be a type of chatty that means I'm not gonna be invited back. <laughs> it's mostly a joke, I haven't done anything that hard in years, you know what I mean? Like I'm just, you know, I'm your classic almost 40 dude, like right after the show, I'm going straight to bed because I wanna get up early tomorrow. I wanna hit that museum before the crowd gets there. <laughs> I love a museum. I fucking love a museum. I find museums to be like anal sex. When asked about them, I always say, I had a wonderful time. But in the moment I am thinking, well, this has gone on long enough. <laughs> Fun fact from the front, friends, that is an anal sex joke from both perspectives. You're looking at a man who has been pegged. Just want to point out a man in his polo shirt just crossed his arms and laughed. What a saying, I do know what you're talking about, but don't ask me about it. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what pegging is, please look it up on your closest workplace computer. <laughs> Got him. Just kidding, of course. Uh, pegging is when a uh, woman affixes a strap-on dildo to her person and then learns how difficult it is to be the one thrusting during sex. <laughs> Quite frankly, I think women uh, should do it. Have you ever pegged anyone, madam? No, you should. It would answer a lot of questions I assume you have about sex with a man. For example, you would learn all those grunts and groans. Nothing to be concerned about. That's just the noise of someone trying to get a cramp out of their ankle. <laughs> But I don't want you guys to be tense, you know what I'm saying? I, uh, and if you want to be experimental, some, you know, this being Britain, you guys are both the, mo the greatest mix of repressed and totally sexually free all at the same time. Sober, you wouldn't even consider the missionary position. How dare you? I shook my wife's hand once, that was enough. <laughs> and 17 pints later, you guys are fucking bushes. Just, Is there a woman in there? Let's fuck a stranger! <laughs> so if you tonight are with your partner and you are considering pegging, Allow me to review the experience for you so you know what you're in for. I found being pegged like going to an escape room. I would have enjoyed it more if for five seconds I could have stopped thinking, what happens if I have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> I 
I cannot describe the silence last night at that joke. Have you ever heard a room get so quiet it actually makes a noise? So, by the way, when I told my friends I've been pegged, each and every one of them went, yeah, that makes sense. And when I told them I got a therapist, each and every one of them went, I don't believe you for some reason. And I do have a therapist. He is not a good therapist. He recently diagnosed me with a fear of abandonment and then canceled our next two sessions. <laughs> now I got a therapist for a variety of reasons. One of them was all my friends got diagnosed with ADHD. So I wanted to get diagnosed with ADHD. And then he diagnosed me with anxiety. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know what it is about my vibe or face, but people are totally fine when I get a medical diagnosis, like I have anxiety. They're totally fine just saying that I'm wrong. Like I was at a dinner party, my friend's wife walked up to me and said, I heard you got diagnosed with anxiety. I don't believe you, you're too tall. <laughs> and here's how my anxiety works. Even though she did a, the, her only qualification is she did a two week yoga training teacher course during the COVID-19 pandemic, which she did not finish. She only got to day five and said, they're too political. Uh, I believed her, even though I was diagnosed by two doctors. I was like, well, this woman in yoga pants probably knows what she's talking about. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean by that? And she just went, what do tall people have to worry about? And then I said, well, birds, first of all. <laughs> and this is going to sound bizarre. I, I like being part of the anxiety tribe. I like seeing other anxious people out there in society trying to confront someone they love while they're in public. That's my favorite time to see an anxious person because they will affect this very low, intense whisper and they will match it with this very angry face. And the reason why they are doing that is they want to convey to the person they're confronting, this is serious, but they don't scream and shout because they don't want the strangers who are passing them to find out that they're confronting someone they love. Maybe that energy will affect the love and the love will go away. That's why they use this very low, intense whisper. Now the problem with this plan is no one conveys positive information in this tone of voice with this kind of face. May I just say, what a wonderful barbecue. You know what I'm saying? This is the last time I will compare you to last night's audience, but you know how weird that joke feels when no one laughs? The man stood there just went, fine. The other thing my therapist helped me do is he helped me establish boundaries uh, with friends of mine. I'm one of those people that has a lot of nicknames I never really fucking cared for. Uh, like my friend Doug, he always calls me Ginger John. And I always assumed he called me Ginger John because of my red hair. And I found out recently he calls me Ginger John because he thinks it's a racial slur for Irish people. <laughs> uh, and he thinks I'm Irish. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. Number one, not a racial slur for Irish people <laughs> at all. You can't even find it on Google. It's not on the, in everything's on the internet. Do you know how lonely you feel when you put that into a search engine, nothing comes back. Not even porn. I think he had a dream and just believed the dream. Second of all, I have no Irish genetic heritage whatsoever. I'm your classic Canadian. I got a little Scottish, a little English, a little Norwegian, a little French. It's all just, you know, a bunch of white people got together, missionaried it up and meet the vicar. You know what I'm saying? And if you're gonna use a racial slur for me, use the Canadian ones. I'm a moose fucker. I'm a maple sucker. Our third one's just Canadian. And I, and I was worried, I was worried to confront Doug about uh, him calling me Ginger John because I was worried. I don't know if you have anxiety, but if you do, this is a very familiar thought. I was worried I would confront him and then uh, he would stop being my friend uh, because of that. And with my therapist's help, I learned we're not actually that close. We see each other every two to five years at a wedding or a christening or a bar mitzvah I've done cocaine at. That was a callback and it deserved more! <laughs> Thank you for tapping your thigh, but not the full applause. Making me, er I know I understood my friend. You know, we just see each other at gatherings. We share the same anecdote back at each other and then move on with our lives. And here's the anecdote. We drank and drove together, which as Canadian teenagers is very much a rite of passage, unfortunately. Just pause, by the way, and say this to my Scottish brothers and sisters. Your drunk driving statistics in this country are shockingly low. 26% of Scottish adults admit to drinking and driving once in their whole life, as opposed to Canadians, 
where it's 85% of Canadian adults admit to drinking and driving 10 times before the age of 30. Gets even scarier when you find out only 81% of Canadians own cars. So when we were 17, uh, Doug had a house party in Scotland. I think you'd call it an empty. And in Canada, we just... Yeah, that's right. I speak your fucking language. Is someone booing? Empty? Good. You're a strange crowd, but in a charming way. Fair. It was a nuts party, by the way. Like, someone stole a toilet. Like, it was fucking crazy. And as a result of the toilet theft, I found myself urinating in a hedge. Uh, next to Doug, who was also urinating in the same hedge. And I turned to him and I said, uh, I wanted to say, hey, I'm gonna get out of here. But instead I just turned to him and threw up on my shoulder <laughs> and fell into the hedge. Uh, I then blacked out completely and I came to in uh, Doug's car. I was in the passenger seat. Uh, Doug was in the driver's seat. He was drinking a beer. Uh, there was a police officer outside of the window tapping on the driver's side window. And I realized, oh, we're in a drunk driving checkpoint and I think we've been identified. <laughs> Doug rolls down the window. Before the officer can say anything, he just goes with, what? <laughs> the officer then said, really, uh, can't, here's the thing with Canada. We have this reputation for being very polite. It's our stereotype, and quite frankly, we got it off very easy in the stereotype department. <laughs> polite? Like the Scottish one, you guys are all drunken, violent assholes. <laughs> The English one, you guys are all cunts, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when it comes to like, Canada, the reason why we have the politeness stereotype is that, um, is that we say, I'm sorry, a lot. And the reason why we say, I'm sorry, a lot, is uh, of how Canada was founded. Canada was founded because the English left us in the snow with their mortal enemies, the French, next to their mortal enemies, America, and we don't know what the fuck we did to deserve that. <laughs> so we haven't stopped apologizing ever since. And it's, it's just a stereotype. Our national linguistic tick is A. We all say A. If you want to identify a Canadian, wait for him to finish a sentence with A, and then just go, I fucking know where you're from, bud. <laughs> now here's the thing that's crazy. Post-COVID, I don't know, maybe people researched Canada while they were making sourdough, I don't know. People have discovered that we say A. So now occasionally when I out myself as a Canadian, a near stranger will just yell A in my face <laughs> until I go, yeah, that's us. <laughs> It's so awkward and bizarre. I actually looked up where A comes from just so I had something to say in that moment. And it turns out that A is old Victorian English slang for I'm sorry. <laughs> We've been fulfilling the stereotype this whole time. That would be like finding out as an American that yeehaw does mean I'm here to fuck my cousin. Do you understand? <laughs> One person applauding is my favorite noise in all of the Edinburgh Festival. It's like you're saying to all of them, I enjoyed it a bit more. <laughs> but in this moment, this officer actually kind of proved the stereotype of politeness correct. Because after uh, <laughs> Doug has just yelled, what? In his face, the officer kneeled down and said, son, have you been drinking this evening? Now, Doug was holding a beer, so <laughs> I don't think this officer is making detective. <laughs> Doug then responds to the question, have you been drinking tonight, with a, yeah, loads! <laughs> the officer, with both hands on the uh, driver's side window of the door from right there, and he just sort of leaned in a little bit and he went, son, how about you put a volume amount on how much alcohol you've consumed this evening? And uh, then Doug said, I don't know, officer. I've been drinking whiskey out of your daughter's pussy all night. <laughs> The noise this side made, that was the noise my soul made. <laughs> when he said that, my first and only thought was, well, I don't know what crime we just committed, but I know we're going to jail. <laughs> I wonder what gang I'll join in there. My heart has always been with the Latin Kings, but with this face, it's Aryan Brotherhood or nothing, so. <laughs> the uh, officer, by the way, responded to, uh, 
Doug bringing up his daughter's pussy uh, by reaching into the car, grabbing him by the neck and dragging him out of the driver's side window and then throwing him into another police cruiser. And that cr- police cruiser took off into the night. Doug spent the next two days in the drunk tank. I've never heard of someone having to spend a second night. <laughs> Not sober enough. Get back in there, pal. Uh, and then Doug left the drunk tank and uh, he went on to become a police officer with three daughters. Now, that's right. I told that last story at each one of their first birthdays and only I enjoyed it. (laughs) Ginger John strikes again. (laughs) I'm now sitting alone in the car. I'm not really sure what to, what's about to happen or what, what I, am I in trouble? Are you allowed to drunk and sit down? Different officer comes, he opens the door, and he looks at me and he goes, uh, do you want us to take you to jail, or do you want us to call your mom? Now, my mom raised me by herself while earning a PhD and working her way through the corporate ranks of the Canadian Post Office. So when that officer said to me, would you like to go to jail, or would you like us to call your mom, I said, jail please. (laughs) Mom didn't raise a fucking idiot. There's rules in jail. There's no rules once I get home. I got news for you right now. And guess what the fucking cops did? They tricked me and called my mom anyway. Yes, that is the other's noise my soul made. Well done. Because she showed up 13 minutes later with a look on her face best described as she now believes in abortion at 833 weeks. She took me home and yelled at me for the next eight hours with the dawn breaking behind her. She wasn't even on topic. She was just giving away family secrets. I didn't realize I raised an irresponsible boy like your Uncle Glenn with that secret family and cocaine problem and all those embezzlement charges your grandfather had to take care of in Manitoba! So six months ago, I flew home for my mom's birthday, slash, to confront Doug about calling me Ginger John. I'm in his kitchen, he's getting me coffee. He says, Ginger John, would you like some milk in your coffee? And I said, no, I would like zero milk in my coffee. And how about you stop calling me Ginger John? And he said, no, I like it. (laughs) Luckily, the moment had been prepared for. So I said, it makes no sense to call me Ginger John. You think it's a racial slur for Irish people. I have no Irish genetic heritage. I just have red hair. Calling me Ginger John would be like walking up to a Jewish person who happens to be able to grow an afro and calling them the N-word. And then he said, well, don't worry. I don't know any Jewish people. (laughs) And then his wife said, I'm Jewish Doug. Do you know how loud your soul sings? <laughs> Watching wife lead husband into the hallway where a photo from their wedding doth hang only for her to point at and go, that's a synagogue, you prick. <laughs> their marriage survived that. They're still together. I'm divorced. They're still together. I don't appreciate, by the way, what I said, I'm divorced. This entire side over here just went, that's what it is. <laughs> Uh, I am divorced. I got divorced uh, during the uh, COVID lockdowns. Not, not the time to do it. Divorce, yeah, I agree. Thank you for those awes. First awe of the Edinburgh Festival. Usually people just sit there going, yeah, we all had problems. <laughs> it was just one of those things, because you need your friends. You need community in that moment. I had none of that. I was just by myself. Like, you know, even like the big moments, you know what I mean? Like the first time I slept with someone that wasn't my wife. I, uh, I, I didn't tell friends over beers. I didn't type it into a WhatsApp group. The first person I told was a police officer conducting a COVID check at an airport. And not one of your fun Scottish cops with their little bellies and they all look like their name is Graham. I love the cops in this city. They look like, none of them look like they know the law. They all look like they know a fuckload about darts and nothing about the law. But this happened in America, so I was dealing with an American cop. You know, like the real police, you know? Yeah, thank you for that fucking noise. I agree. Because Eve, Eve, the the booing is a bit fucking much, okay? It's not like the fucking cops in England are fucking heroes either. And I know that Scotland is not England, but you're close enough, so calm the fuck down! Now, 
It's just like American cops, like even when they're trying to be nice or helpful, they come across as fucking terrifying. Like on, uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, I did a gig in Dallas, Texas, and then I bought a bunch of weed from one of the dishwashers, and then I uh, sat in my hotel's parking lot, and I smoked mad weed by myself listening to The Grateful Dead. It was the best New Year's Eve I've ever had. Uh, some of you are going, oh, John, were you lonely? No, I was alone. There's a difference. <laughs> I, uh, it was fucking awesome, just by myself, and about uh, about 1.30, I'm just dancing, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah, that's right. And, uh, oh, John, you dance white, like a white man, by choice. And uh, a cop car pulled into the parking lot, and he immediately turned on his sirens and drove straight towards me with purpose and determination. The car stopped right at my feet. He rolled down the window and went, I don't mind people smoking marijuana. I like the smell. Happy New Year. And then he drove away. <laughs> Leaving me to sit there wondering, what the fuck w was an emergency in that? <laughs> Did he see me smoking weed and just thought, that guy's not paranoid enough. Hit the lights. <laughs> so what happened um, in COVID is I, I ran out of money at a certain point. I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to say. And uh, so I took a gig in a part of America that uh, treated COVID the way 10 Downing Street did. I didn't even have to fucking finish that joke. You understand. You know what I mean? It was the part of America that was just like, oh, that looks like a problem for someone else. Let's party. You know what I mean? So I flew to Arizona. The next day, I flew back. What the fuck was that noise? Are you from Arizona? No, but we don't claim it in the United States. You fuck. I live in fucking America. You guys have, you can't fucking do what the UK does. Where you, that's not them, it's the other people. Listen, I've been to every state in the union. You're all a bit fucking nuts. I got new, like, thank you. Like, where are you, what part of the states are you from? Washington. Washington, you don't get to fucking sit there being like, we don't claim Arizona. I saw a homeless guy at the airport in Washington, DC. How delayed was that flight? <laughs> They say don't do new material at the Edinburgh Fringe, and I say, Maverick has arrived. Now, thank you, by the way. I always wondered if that joke was funny. But, like, you can hear the, like, listen, if you've never been to Washington, D.C., they claim that the wire is set in Maryland. It's set in fucking Washington. Do you understand? Like, that place is fucking nuts, and she without any sort of hypocrisy, can look down on Arizona and go, no, those fucks are crazy. <laughs> and I flew back from this place and I landed in LA and there was one day during COVID that Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, erected a hard border against the rest of the country and that's because one in three people on that day had COVID in LA. So their strategy was they sent the LAPD to the airport and we had to just tell the LAPD what we did in the other city and then the cop got to decide whether we went home or if I moved to Arizona <laughs> without any of my stuff. And this is the LAPD. Do you have to understand? This is, these are not, they're not known for their understanding. And you know that based off of the songs they have inspired. Fuck the Police by NWA. The Cops Are Duh Corrupt by KRS-One. Cop Killer, bracket. We gotta kill these cops. <laughs> by Ice T. I don't care for these gentlemen. They're weird. By John Hastings. <laughs> now, when I got off the airplane and I was explaining what was about to happen, I made a, I made, so I decided I'm just gonna be honest and let, I'll take my fucking lumps. Whatever happens, happens. COVID was a check of our ethics and morals. And I felt it was important to be honest in that moment for the strangers I could affect. So I walk up to this fucking steroid with eyes. <laughs> And he just stares at me over a black clipboard. He just goes, well, you were in Tucson, Arizona. Did you engage in any behavior that would be a violation of COVID-19 lockdown protocols? And I said, uh, well, let's find out together, officer. I flew there yesterday and performed stand-up comedy in a room best described as unventilated. <laughs> I... Um, uh, then joined a dating app. I met a lady. Uh, we went back to what she kept calling a trailer, and I would call a shed with no door. <laughs> uh, we were about to have sex, which is very exciting. That would be the first person I'm sleeping with that isn't my wife. Um, I'm going through a divorce, so it's okay. But instead of having sex, I had a panic attack instead. Now, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Uh, imagine you, how weird it is to hear about it. Imagine living it. Uh, 
And uh, I didn't really want to do that in front of her because she is a stranger, so I hid in her closet, which did have a door. <laughs> and I was just in there kind of screaming and crying for about 45 minutes. And at the end of that 45 minutes, she uh, knocked on the closet door and said through the door, hey, it looks like uh, traditional sex is off the cards for us tonight, but I'm a dominatrix. Would you like me to peg you instead? <laughs> And it turns out, officer, that was just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> and then he said, were you wearing that mask the whole time on the plane? And I said, I was. And then he said, welcome to California. <laughs> if I, 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 I wish divorce on none, on, on none of you. It was, it's a fucking weird experience. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's difficult. You do things you never thought you'd have to do. Like I had to switch back my happiest day on earth, like it was my wedding, as is tradition. And then I switched it back to what it had always been before, the time I was on a bus and I saw a homeless man fart so loud, it knocked over a child. <laughs> that joke was so good, this gentleman turned to his friend to make sure he was laughing. If you're reviewing the show, I want that noted in the review. How funny is John? A man who looks like he's either a roadie or grows weed checked with his friend who looks like he could hack into the mainframe. Now, <laughs> it's fucking nuts. It's also weird. It's one of those times where people really just like, they, they want to grill you for information. Like friends say things like, oh, do you regret getting married? No, I don't. Yeah, we, we loved each other at the moment. It felt like the right thing to do at the time. Our love did not continue for as long as we wanted it to, so we parted as best of friends you can be with someone you break up with. And, and I like the man that that experience made me. I, I got into therapy. I addressed a lot of issues that I never fucking addressed. I, I joined dating apps for the first time. And the reason why that was a big moment for me is I was very nervous always joining dating apps because of the way I look in photos. We've been together for some time now in this basement that somehow feels like an attic. <laughs> You can tell that I'm charming, fun, and nice. That does not come across in a photograph. In a photograph, at best, I look like my opinions aren't up for discussion. And at worst, I just look like I'm there to kill women. You know what I'm saying? So I joined dating apps, and I gotta tell you, I, I, I dig them. I, they were very fun. Now, part of that is coming from a place of privilege because no one's sending me unsolicited penis photographs. <laughs> you are aware of the unsolicited penis photographs? Now are you aware of this fucking fun fact I learned recently? Are you aware that the majority of those photos are of flaccid dicks? <laughs> right? Who, who, did you just say what? I couldn't agree more, by the way. Imagine being part of that part of the species, just being like, gentlemen, another confusing decision. Because I don't understand the idea of sending someone a photo of your penis without being asked to show them a photo of their penis. But also, gentlemen, if you're gonna get up to that sort of nonsense, best cock forward, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, don't, I now don't know what the fuck you're up to. Like, I always assumed it was some form of intimidation. Who the fuck is intimidated by a flaccid penis? <laughs> oh my God, it looks like a very old baby snake. Let's get out of here. Uh, oh my God, it looks like a badly folded fitted sheet. What to do? What to do? Oh my God, why is that sleeping bag made of leather and put away badly? Oh no, it's a penis. <laughs> Here's why I like dating apps, if I'm totally fucking honest. They removed wingmen from my fucking life. There's a lot of people around my age, and we all went through this in fucking college or university, which is if you'd go, if you're nervous about talking to women, like I always was, you would bring your friends with you to where women might be, and their job was supposed to be like bigging you up and make you feel good, and that's never how it fucking went. They were never stood behind me going like, oh, you gotta try his penis, most delicious. <laughs> One time in the bar, right fucking out there, right out there, I was with my friend Tim, I was chatting up a lady. Now Tim has cerebral palsy, it's important in one second. I'm talking to this lady, Tim gets in between us, looks at her and just goes, hey, lady, you should fuck him. I did, look what happened to me. <laughs> She went home with him. 
And it's, it's, this is going to sound weird, uh, but I like you guys, so I'll be totally honest. I, I feel a bit, I get angry and get defensive when people are like, I don't like dating apps. Because I, I met someone on a dating app, and she filled my, she's filled my life with love and happiness. It's the best relationship I've ever been in. Don't tell my ex-wife. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's fucking, it's good. And I, it, without a dating app, I wouldn't have found her. And I've changed because of that relationship in only positive, good ways. Like I became a cat guy. I know I have serious dog guy energy and not a fun dog. This is Pistol. Half Doberman, half truck. Why are you breathing through your nose and mouth around him? That's an attack command to him. What are you doing? I'm a cat guy. By the way, whenever you say you're a cat guy, only the women go woo and all the men act like you betrayed them. And I know there's some people in here that aren't cat people and they're probably sitting there like, I don't like cats, actually. My ex-girlfriend had a cat and I petted it once and it hissed at me. Now I hate all cats. Wow. Wow, your views on race must be enlightened. Now... <laughs> Here's what turned me around on cats, because I'm aware they have a bit of a sour disposition when you encounter them in the morning. But here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. Cats are nocturnal creatures. If you see them in the daytime, they don't want pets or treats. They're trying to figure out how to say, shut the fuck up, in meow. <laughs> Put yourself in the cat's paws. How would you feel if in the middle of the night, your flatmate came into your room and started rubbing your whole body? <laughs> asking you if you were a good boy. I think you'd think, I'm throwing up somewhere, you walk barefoot, prick. I sort of revealed somewhere back there that I live in America now. If you've never been to America, fucking come. Washington's nuts, and they do not like people from Arizona. I, listen, I, I like America. You don't have to like America. I like America for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons I like America is because the last place I lived was London, England, and anywhere would be a pleasure. <laughs> I know this is pushing a fucking open door in Scotland, but fucking hell. Gee, like three days into living in London, I'm just talking to my uncle on the phone, just having a nice conversation, just trying to get a little piece of home, and some crooked fucker bicycled by me and stole my phone off my head. <laughs> Uh, it is very funny when it's not you. Like, you can totally laugh. Like, I once was in Rome, Italy, and I saw a guy get his phone stolen by someone on a Vespa scooter, and he walked over to a different guy on a different Vespa scooter and punched him, and then just said, tell your friend. So, I'm in London, my phone's just stolen, I give chase to this fucker through the streets of uh, Highbury, if you must know, and I'm, I'm running, and I'm screaming, give me back my phone, hey motherfucker, give me back my phone, hey motherfucker, that's my fucking phone! Now you have to understand, and this is a weird brag, I'm much faster than I look like I should be. So I nearly had this prick, like I, his fucking windbreaker were touched by these fingy tips and I would have fucking gotten them, but I tripped on an uneven piece of pavement, fell face first into some cobblestones, bloodied my whole face, rolled on my back and just screamed in anguish and frustration, fuck my phone! And then an Englishman walked by and just said, swearing will not return your telephone. <laughs> So fuck off, I live in America now, and I like it. We got Joe Biden, come on, Joe Biden's great. Yeah, 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 Joe Biden's like the British economy, dead, and yet, still going, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna question it. Uh, and that, to answer the question that I can feel burning on some of the tips of some of the British people's minds, even though there are some Shermans here, and we'd call them septics if they weren't. Um, yeah, that's right, Cockney rhyming slang. Anyway, so, is the question that I get asked a lot about my adopted country and your homeland is, uh, are Americans fucking idiots? Short answer, yes. Yeah, long, long answer, more complicated than you realize. I think there's this sort of notion in this country, there was a day in America where it was like, books or burgers, choose it. And they ate the burger and then fucked the book and then shot that guy and were like, fuck yeah, you know what I mean? It's, it's actually much sadder than that. By the way, that's the, I just know, anytime you open your fucking mouths on this island, they're just the, these fucking idiots, you know what I mean? <laughs> fucking morons. 
And they, there's a lot of dumb people in America. And a, re, the real reason is, in 1980, their president, Ronald Reagan, canceled all funding for education at a federal level, and they've never replaced that money. So instead, they've conducted a 43-year experiment into what happens on a planet if you have 300 million dumb fucks that will try anything once. <laughs> you need to update the branding. America's flag should not be the stars and stripes. It should be a mural of a man stood in front of a nuclear bomb's mushroom cloud, and he should just be saying, I did not know it could do that. <laughs> but look how big it is. We're doing it again! <laughs> And I am aware of America's problems. I, I, I was there for one of the darkest chapters in 2020 when a uh, Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. We all watched it on YouTube. I was there when LA fucking lit up for four days of riotous violence as people said, we no longer will fucking take this fucking shit. And I'm really looking forward to the day it happens in the UK. I don't know what they have to fucking do to you to get you fucks to rise up. Do they have to come to your house and kill your grannies? What the fuck? I live in America. They'll leave the house and shoot someone just because. You know what I'm saying? I'm not pro that. I'm just saying, Rishi Sunak, where the fuck did you find this guy? I'd call him a money-grubbing cunt, but he's too cute. You know what I'm saying? He looks like a trophy you would win for best money-grubbing cunt. You know what I'm saying? Uh, to the Americans who may not understand that joke, let me quickly explain it. It was very good. So, uh... After four days of people fucking fighting the police to fucking say enough is enough. Something happened that wasn't covered in the news. I don't know if this happened in Washington, this happened in LA. It's people left their homes again to fill the streets with positivity and community because we'd been locked inside for six months and then the city burned for four days. And then we were expecting, like it was crazy. I had three riots happening simultaneously in front of my block of flats. Do you know how weird that moment is? If someone had come to me and said, the rioters have gotten into the building, I would have had to say, you're gonna need to be more specific. <laughs> so, and, and that chant, the chant after all of the violence was amazing. People were just trying to inspire community in Los Angeles. I'm happy to say I lent my voice to those chants and to those songs. Now, I didn't know there was a protest happening. I, I was just out running errands while doing laundry, and I saw it come by, and I thought, I want to be part of history, and I also thought, you need to get better at your social media, and that's a good place to start. <laughs> So I joined the protest. Now, I will say this about this crowd. You've been a great crowd. You will also all be ready to join a protest. Maybe not you, just a bit too garish of the color of that polo, but everything else spot on. I was not in that position. Because I was doing laundry, I was in that sort of moment that we all have had while doing laundry where it's not so much an outfit, it's just what was left. So I'm wearing a very tight pink Hawaiian shirt, jean cutoffs that are uneven in their cutting, and two different flip. Stop interrupting my art! <laughs> that, that would have been better if you guys had laughed. <laughs> Instead, you guys sounded like you were agreeing with the youths in the alley. <laughs> Stop vaping without smoking! You look like assholes! <laughs> Let's hope they don't come back. That door is open. Now... <laughs> so I joined this protest wearing a very t tight pink Hawaiian shirt, uneven... They knocked over my bag. <laughs> the youth today. I'm gonna describe my outfit one more time. <laughs> Now, here's what you gotta know about comedy. It requires timing and precision. We have lost both of those things. But I just enjoy this joke, so we're just gonna fucking take a run at it. And if we don't get there, well, I've fucking explained why. I'll tell you another time I had to explain something. It was when I was wearing a very tight pink Hawaiian shirt. Back in the bit, how does he do it? Now. <laughs> So I got this very tight pink Hawaiian shirt, uneven jean cutoffs. Like literally one was like up to here and one was here. And I remember it because I was like, I can eyeball this. And I did this one first and went, that's too high. And then I just did this one and went, yeah, well, you just ruined those jeans. Uh, and then I was wearing two different flip-flop sandals. One said Nike, one said Adidas. Will they ever get along? I joined that protest not looking like I was there 
to call for racial equality. I looked like I was a police officer who was going undercover as a homophobe <laughs> who fucks men. So I, and I, I don't know if any of you are politically active people, and if you're not, I still say go to one march or one protest in your life. And here's why. It is the best place to hear someone try and get a chant started <laughs> and then fail. <laughs> For three hours, I listened to someone try and get the following off the ground. I'm not saying white people are evil, but when Michael Jackson was black, he sang with his brothers. When he became white, he fucked kids in a castle. Everybody! <laughs> After the first hour, a woman walked up to me and said, officer, can you do something about that? I don't know what this body language was, but fuck me, was it comfortable? Now. And come to LA. Have you ever been to Washington, lady? You been to LA? Sure. That's not a yes or a no. Yeah, well, yeah. What the fuck is up with East Coast people? Like, LA, I get it, it's nuts. But, like, it's in a fun way. You know what I mean? Four months ago, I was in an Uber. Uber driver said to me, mind if I smoke? And I used to smoke cigarettes. And I know they just go with driving so well. So I said, yeah, brother, light him up. And then he started smoking crystal meth. <laughs> Now, to add to even more confusion, after about four minutes, once we were getting onto the motorway, he said, now don't worry, it's crystal meth. <laughs> Leading me to wonder, pretty much every day from that day to this, what the fuck did he think I thought he was doing that warranted a fucking clarification? He's up there smoking crystal meth. It's the most nox or toxic narcotic you can put in your body. It'll put a hole in your brain after your first use. It'll cause your teeth to fall out permanently after your first use. And you're at risk of getting visual and auditory hallucinations for life after one hit off of that pipe. And this guy's had about 20 hauls in 30 seconds while we're driving on a motorway fast. And his only thought is, I better say something. I don't want this guy thinking I'm vaping or something. <laughs> But come to LA, brothers and sisters. Come to LA, come for a fucking visit. You'll, just, you'll see shit you never thought you would see. I saw a guy fought the, fight the police for 25 minutes. And I don't mean metaphorically. I mean, on the first day of COVID, I was waiting for a train to get home. I'm on the platform at Union Station in LA. There's three other people and a police officer who's kind of directing traffic. A guy gets off a train, walks up to the cop, punches the cop in the face. The co yes, I agree. And then the cop gets up. They start having a fist fight. Three other cops join. And I watch one man fight four cops by himself. <laughs> and while I was watching that, I thought, well, if the cops win, they'll arrest him. And if he wins, well, then I work for him now. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you've ever watched, like, you know, being in this city, we've all seen a fist fight over this month. You know what I mean? It was 30 seconds because a bouncer broke it up or a girlfriend just, Jason, no! You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Terry! Like, that's the vibe. 25 minutes. I don't know if you've ever seen a fist fight for 25 minutes. Here would be my review. Boring. <laughs> Fucking throw a clothesline. Let's see some fucking pro wrestling moves. Do a power bomb. What the fuck? You know what I'm saying? And 25 minutes. The other thing that happened is my lizard brain activated. My brain was like, you're next. You're gonna join the fight. No, I'm not. Bunch of reasons. One, I failed stage combat at theater school. Do you think a... Second of all, I, I have dyspraxia. If you don't know what dyspraxia is, it was, means I was born without reflexes or hand-eye coordination. The main ingredients in being a good fighter. I have been in one fist fight once, I threw a punch like this and sprained my ankle. It, it took eight officers to subdue this man, but for some reason I was so amped on adrenaline, like I was sweating, like, put me in, coach. When a cop came over to me, to take my statement and like pierce the whole moment. And he just went, now did you? And I for some reason cut him off there and said, appear on America's Got Talent? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> some people ask, John, how can you afford to live in a city as expensive as Los Angeles? Well, after I do our shows, nice people who, uh, put money in my bucket. If you bought a ticket, you're under no obligation. If you didn't buy a ticket, you gotta put some money in the bucket. And if you did buy a ticket and you wanna give me more money, fuck yeah. <laughs> A couple of people had said, I'd give you more, but I already bought a ticket. That doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> if you got some spare, that noise is the card machine. We take cards. 
Um, but seriously, I know there's a recession on. If you can't, don't fucking worry about it. But if you can, Washington, D.C., we're looking your way. I'll see you out there. And let me just say this, and I don't want to fucking come across too fucking raw, raw America. It's just, it's, it's, it's my home. And I, I, I like it. You don't have to like it. You don't like to have to like the people. You don't have to like the politics. I like it. What I like about America is it's a, a land of opportunity. And it feels like a land of opportunity. The United Kingdom is many things. This is not a land of opportunity. <laughs> this is a land of like, you could try that, but I would not try that. <laughs> America is a land of opportunity. I once hit a pig with a rental car. I've never been given that opportunity in Scotland. I, I was driving home uh, through the desert that's on one side of Los Angeles. I was driving home very late at night, on the motorway, listening to a podcast. You know, just living my best late 30s life. And uh, at one point on the motorway, I went over a speed bump. And about 25 minutes later, I thought, there's no speed bumps on the motorway. <laughs> you ever have one of those thoughts where you're like, I should have figured that out 24 <laughs> minutes and 30 seconds ago? So I pull into a petrol station and I walk to the front of the car. Now I'm expecting to see like a scratch on the bumper. Like, you know how cars have a front? This one no longer did. <laughs> so I immediately called a tow truck driver. He showed up, got underneath the car, looked around a little bit, came out, looked at me and just went, um, you hit a pig. And then I said, what? And then he said, you know, a pig. Oink, oink. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh's friend. A pig. That's what it's like being me, friends. This guy says something insane, like you hit a pig. Well, we're stood in a desert, not on a farm where pigs live. And I respond with the very simple, what? And his only response is, this guy doesn't know what a pig is. <laughs> So pigs are the only uh, mammal that can go from domesticated back to wild. Pigs escape from the factory farms that are on one side of that desert. They wander the desert looking for food. They find food at the road's edge because human beings litter. They eat that food, then fall asleep on the road, and then get run over by people like me. It's amazing the information a tow truck driver will have. <laughs> he then said, uh, we need to call the police. And I said, why is the pig a friend of theirs or something? <laughs> Boy, could have used you guys that night. What a real Wednesday and the last week of the Edinburgh Fringe reaction that man had. As it turns out, by the way, the reason why we had to call the police is that in California, check this fucking hippy dippy bullshit out. In, in California, if you kill a living thing, which is the only way to do that. <laughs> a smarter joke than you were expecting, I understand. I impress myself. You have, to, you have to tell the police if you kill a living thing in California. Now, they mean big things. I took an anthill out, and they were pretty pissed off the 75th time I called them. So, two officers are uh, dispatched, and when they arrive, I am immediately filled, not even with terror, panic. Con like, I've never been more fucking scared in my life. Over the last hour, I have told you every moment in my adult life where I spoke or interacted with law enforcement. I was nervous, I was worried, I was never on the edge of a panic attack until this moment. And that is because pig is a very derogatory term for police officer. It's like their ginger, if that was a thing. And I got even more fucking terrified when the officers arrived because one of them had a nose like this. <laughs> And I was like, what do you do? What do you do? And I think pretty quick on my feet, so I quickly just took my hat off and just thought, maybe they think I used to work for them, you know. I'll get away with this. And I walk up to them. First one says, what did you hit, son? And I just said very calmly, a pig. And the second one said, did you say pig? And that sounded like a trap. So I said, that's right, a pig. Oink, oink. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh's friend, a pig. And then the first one said, now did you know that pig is a derogatory term for police officer? And then I said, 
I was unaware of that, officer. I am from Canada, and up there we call you guys the Beaver Boys. And the first guy said, good to know, and the second guy said, Canada, hey, hey, hey! That means I'm sorry, as it turns out. The officers uh, left. I walked back to the tow truck driver. He was sad. Put my hand on his shoulder because I didn't know what else to do. And I was also not expecting him to be sad. And I was like, what the fuck? Maybe the pig was a friend of his. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, I, and I say, are you all right, man? And he went, I, uh, he goes, I got something to tell you and I don't know how to tell you this. And I'm just like, what the fuck is my next challenge going to be? <laughs> And I say, what's up, brother? And he just goes, look, I've been to uh, 19 separate scenes uh, where a vehicle uh, uh, hit a pig, and you are the first person to survive hitting a pig with a car. Usually a hoof or a tusk goes into the front tire, the car veers into oncoming traffic, and the driver is killed instantly. But he then went, but that didn't happen to you, and you told me you're getting married next month. I think this is a really good omen that that relationship is going to work out <laughs> and everything is going to be good from now on. And then we parted as friends, the kind of friends that never see each other again. And uh, the next month I went on and got married and then 13 months after that, we got divorced. So it's a good thing I hit that pig or something bad could have happened. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have to exit this way. I will see you out there. Thank you so much. Have a great night. You're the best. We got this on camera. Thank you for being a great crowd. I'll see you out there. Good night.